kids in the classroom, but is giving parents a, quote, virtual option. Remembering John Lewis. Here's Lester Holt. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special coverage remembering the late congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis on this, the third of six days of tributes that will conclude Thursday with Lewis being laid to rest in Atlanta. John Lewis's body arrived moments ago at Joint Base Andrews outside Washington, D.C., just moments ago after tributes this weekend in Alabama. Today, Lewis's final journey will take him through Washington, where he spent much of his life pausing at some of the places that held great meaning for him, including the Martin Luther King Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the National African American Museum, and finally the Capitol itself. John Lewis came to Washington as a Georgia congressman 33 years ago and earned the reputation as the conscience of the Congress. As we see the uh, motorcade make its way off of the uh, joint base, uh, he was in Washington more than two decades before that to witness President Johnson's signing of the Voting Rights Act, legislation that his courage helped push forward. Lewis's body will rest in the Capitol Rotunda as fellow members of Congress pay tribute today, and then uh, he will lie in state on the east steps of the Capitol where the public will pay their respects through Tuesday. We've got our correspondents and some special guests standing by to help cover uh, today's events. I do want to start with um, John Meacham, an NBC News contributor who's uh, just written a book on, on John Lewis's life, uh, listing off those places that this motorcade will either pass by or pause at. How does that describe the Washington, uh, John, as seen through the lens of John Lewis? These are the monuments and the places which, to which his life gave full and vibrant expression. His first trip to Washington was in May of 1961. When he first came to this city, he came to join the Freedom Rides, which began in Washington and then headed down uh, through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, into Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. He began that journey here, where he's been brought home for the last time. But he ended that journey at Parchman Prison in Mississippi, a uh, devastating place. William Faulkner called it destination doom. But he did it because he was summoning all of us to actually live up to the creed that is embodied in the monuments in this city. And I think the work of John Lewis's life was to take the high-minded and the rhetorical and make it real. And he was willing to give his life at every point for that. And so as he goes to the, Lincoln, the Dr. King's memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, where he spoke in 1963, gave, giving a fiery speech, the Kennedy administration was so worried about the radical young John Robert Lewis that they had two guys stationed inside the memorial ready to cut the microphones if Lewis uh, got too radical. And they were going to play a recording of Mahalia Jackson's I've Got the Whole World in My Hands. Con contrast that, that skepticism of the federal establishment, to what we're seeing now. This is a hero's welcome, and it's the rites and ceremonies that we most often associate with military heroes. But I think it's important for us to remember today and tomorrow and through the rest of the week, not every war hero served overseas. This is a man who walked into enemy fire in his own land and helped redeem that land to a large extent. And we will continue to watch the procession, the motorcade, making its way slowly into Washington to begin uh, making these stops at these various places along the way. And as you noted, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, uh, uh, Congressman Lewis was the last surviving speaker of that march on Washington. I want to go to Kristen Welker, who is at the memorial right now, to give us some more of the flavor and context there. Lester, John Lewis was just 23 years old when he spoke here at the March on Washington in 1963. He was the youngest speaker, and he spoke with an urgency and an impatience for change that would mark his entire career. Here are some of his words 
Lester, he said, to those who have said, be patient and wait, we have long said that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. You heard John Meacham talk about the fact that the Kennedy administration was concerned about some of his fiery rhetoric. Well, so were some of the organizers of the march, including Martin Luther King Jr., who made him take out some of the most fiery references. They were concerned that it would undercut the broader message of nonviolence. So, for example, they made him take out a reference to Sherman's march across the South. They made him take out a reference to Scorch Earth. But Lewis's message was the same. He was demanding change, and he was demanding it right now. And that is a message that he would carry throughout his entire career as he fought for voting rights, as he fought against gun violence, and in most recent days as he fought for Black Lives Matter. And he continued that fight for freedom, equality, and justice, Lester, into his final days. I had a chance to cover a virtual town hall that he did with former President Barack Obama. He was so energized and excited by the protests that he saw stretching all across the country. He talked about the fact that they were diverse. They brought together people of all ages, races, cultural backgrounds. He saw them as the change. He said they're going to help redeem the soul of America and save our country and maybe help save a planet. Lester, this was a civil rights icon who was impatient for change in 1963 when he was just 23 years old, and he was impatient until his final days demanding change. Lester. All right, Kristen, thanks very much. The first stop along the way will be at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. I want to bring in Martin Luther King III right now to reflect on that. Martin, um, your pop inspired him. He talked about that a lot. He became a, a student of, an, of the nonviolent movement. I want to get your thoughts on that and also your personal reflections on, on, on this loss and as we see the passing of, of, of this, that generation that fought the struggle. Well, the other day, first of all, I, I said that last Friday, uh, was um, a tragic loss for our nation and world, but a great reunion because I'm sure my mother and father welcomed him home along with C.T. Vivian and, and so many others. But as I, I reflect, I, I think as a child, John Lewis was Uncle John to us. And uh, all over the years, he was in and out of our home during the time of the modern civil rights movement of the leadership of my father. And also later on, of course, over the years uh, with my mother as she and others worked to get the King holiday and many other pieces of legislation, uh, always right there when the King Center actually had certain legislation, it was Congressman Lewis who brought that legislation. And most recently it became a national park. And that was again, Congressman Lewis. Uh, there was so much love and respect uh, tremendous, tremendous love for this man that he personified to everybody. He was a nonviolent warrior, a peaceful nonviolent warrior. And as the uh, SCLC uh, it embraced the slogan to redeem the soul of America, that is what John Lewis uh, wanted to see happen. And of course, uh, we haven't gotten there. But at least seeing now the largest civil rights demonstrations on the history of our planet uh, is one level of a continuing tribute uh, to this wonderful, incredible, and phenomenal man uh, that we all loved and respected so much. He, of course, one of his last public appearances was at the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, plaza in Washington, D.C., and he got to see this rebirth of this movement, of this re-energization of, of, of this, this movement. Um, reflect, if, if you can, on the next generation, the torch, where he's passing the torch. Well, first of all, John Lewis never, never passed by a group of young people without stopping to, to encourage them uh, to talk about why it was important to vote why it was important to be participants. And he showed us how to be a participant. He never was on the sidelines. He was always leading. But as I said, I never saw him pass by a group of young people without stopping and encouraging him. 
Uh, no matter how busy he was, he always took an extra moment to encourage, to tell people, don't give up, don't give in, don't give out. Keep going. We're going to get there. We're going to see a better union, a better America. And so I think that young people all over this nation and world have seen this example and are carrying that banner uh, from all different ages. You know, uh, my, my do our daughter was so inspired by his, his leadership. Uh, she was able to speak at the March for Our Lives, but she often talked about going down to Selma. And every time we went to Selma, she was always happy to see Congressman John Lewis as he brought a bipartisan group of people from all over the nation to Selma every year for many, many years. And uh, we're not there yet again. That's why the hope is that the John Lewis Restoration Voter Registration Act is enacted today. And I know that the Senate, I mean, the House, excuse me, probably will pass it. And I hope that uh, our senators, particularly on the other side of the aisle, are willing to engage and say, not only was this a great man, we want to memorialize by passing this act to make sure that no one is ever discriminated around voting. Martin, great to have you with us uh, during this coverage as we look at the, the view from the uh, procession itself, from the motorcade, as it makes its way into Washington, D.C., where it will pass and in some cases stop at some of these significant uh, places in uh, Congressman Lewis's life. And I mentioned Black Lives Matter Plaza, and that's where our Jeff Bennett is right now. Jeff, do you have a sense of what will take place there? Uh, Lester, well, I can tell you that uh, friends and supporters of the late congressman have gathered here. They've been here since around 8 a.m. Eastern. And as you mentioned, Congressman Lewis's funeral procession will pass by so many sites that have historic relevance and that are certainly relevant to the civil rights movement. And it spans the arc of his life. It, it tells the story of civil rights in this country. And so it's fitting that the procession will, will come by Black Lives Matter Plaza. And just a point of context, this area until about two months ago was simply known as 16th Street. But DC Mayor Muriel Bowser renamed it and commissioned this two block long mural with the words Black Lives Matter emblazoned on it, in large part as a silent protest against the Trump administration. And Congressman Lewis came here shortly after its unveiling. He gave what amounted really to a benediction. And he said that the people of D.C. Has, have sent a, a, a strong and powerful message. That ended up being his final public appearance. You can see just over my shoulder here, the city has erected uh, that image and people have been taking pictures in front of it all morning. Among the great many ways that Congressman Lewis changed American life, and changed American politics is that he really helped set an example for young activists, young organizers, to figure out how to turn that passion into policy. He, of course, was a civil rights activist who became an elected official, had a seat at the table to craft policy that would change people's lives in, in discernible and demonstrable ways. And I'm told by a lot of those young activists that he always found time to help mentor them, to help inspire them. He helped shape them. He shared stages with them at demonstrations. And so even as, as, as John Lewis was an elder statesman of the movement, even though he was an icon of the, of, the, of the civil rights movement, he was still committed to the work. In 2013, he was arrested alongside uh, young millennial activists as they pushed for comprehensive immigration reform. He staged that sit-in on the House floor after that mass shooting at that Orlando uh, nightclub in 2016. And when he wasn't protesting, he was always finding time to, to talk to young people, to tell them about American history, and more importantly, Lester, tell them about their place in American history. Lester. All right, Jeff, thanks very much. I want to bring in, happy to bring in uh, Charlene Hunter Gault, a journalist, longtime friend of, of Congressman Lewis. Uh, Charlene, it's great to, great to have you on. And I know you have reflected that, you know, we, we focus very much on the events of Selma, uh, Bloody Sunday. Uh, but, but, but tell us about the other things that will define his legacy in those early days, things like being a member of the Freedom Riders. Thank you so much, Lester. It's good to be back with you on NBC. Let me just say that I sit here with a tissue because one of the things that John had in common, John and I had in common, one of the few things was that we would cry at a bad commercial. And the, one of the last times I was with him was when he won the, uh, when he was awarded the Ivan Allen Prize for Social Justice. And I was talking about um, how much he had inspired me when I was at the University of Georgia as one of the first two black students, because John and those young people who were on the Freedom Rides 
were prepared to die for freedom. And that so inspired me. I mean, in a way, they were polishing my armor, uh, the armor that I needed to do what I was doing at the University of Georgia. And so when I mentioned that, he was sitting on the front row and I said, and you know, I'm almost close to tears like I am now <laughs> uh, because I said, you know, John cries easily. And at that point, I started to cry and John started to cry. And it's just what everybody else was saying. He was such a human uh, being. He, he, he just um, helped people relate to him, not as an icon of the civil rights movement, but as a, as a person who believed in who he had faith and he believed that what he was doing and what the other students were doing was right according to God's principles. And I think that's part of the what helped him get through his faith. People have talked about his love and his compassion for people. And I think that that was what led him to feel comfortable as he was getting ready to go on that first freedom ride to leave his will to say that we may not make it back. So like Bakari Sellers said the other day, we can be emotional but not sad because John was always prepared for his transition. And I think that's what gave him so much courage. He also had real respect for the elders. In fact, I remember him saying that when they first were involved in the sit-ins in North Carolina, he said to go to jail was to bring shame and disgrace on the family. And so he went against everything that young black students had been taught. But at the same time, Diane Nash said that they were, he said, and they agreed, he was on a holy crusade. And so she said, the movement had a way of reaching inside you and bringing out things that you didn't even know were there. And so that was part of what led John on. And somebody referred a few minutes ago to the things that he stood for. It wasn't just civil rights. It was for human rights. It was for voting rights. It was for economic uh, security for all people. And it was to embrace everybody. That's what drove him away from Stokely Carmichael right. when Carmichael took over the movement, that he wanted white and black people together to work for realizing the true meaning of our democracy. Well, Charlene, as I said, good to have you. And don't worry about those tears. I think you won't be the only one shedding a few as over the next few days as we say goodbye uh, to, to Congressman Lewis. Washington Post associate editor and columnist and NBC News contributor Eugene Robinson joins us right now. Eugene, uh, we have watched the marches of the last several weeks. We've watched so many young faces. Um, young people who some of whom may be may be new to the struggle for racial justice and i keep thinking at, at the passing of congressman lewis and and what a what a learning moment this is what a what a powerful history lesson this is for those young people now who whether they know it or not are carrying his torch right lester he was always a great teacher in in that regard uh, um you know and um uh, John Meacham earlier mentioned that his first trip to Washington, since we're talking about his Washington years today, his, his first trip to Washington was in 1961 to join the Freedom Riders. Um, the, on that trip, he made his, he, it was his first um, opportunity to go to a sit-down restaurant in his life. He was 21 years old. He'd never been to a sit-down restaurant. He came from rural Alabama during Jim Crow. Um, and so he always remembered that. Then he got on the bus uh, with the Freedom Riders and uh, and almost lost his life on that trip in my home state of South Carolina, in Rock Hill, South Carolina. He was almost beaten to death and not for the not for the last time in his life. Um, I really only got to know him. Um, I had met him, but only really got to know him when he was already an elder statesman here in Washington, but an elder statesman who never really got old um, and whose, whose eternal mission was working with young people and was um, uh, teaching 
young young people. Um, uh, during the early two thousands, my my wife Avis for a while ran a scholarship nonprofit for um, uh, high achieving low income African American students in this area. Uh, she needed a speaker for her annual event one year, and she just cold called uh, John Lewis, um, not really having a connection, not really knowing. He, that come by my office. Um, they talked about our program for a while. He 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 was enthusiastic, decided it was worthy, and he showed up and he just gave lavishly of his of his time um, and of his support. And that's and he did that day after day after day after day. That that was his life. That was his mission uh, on this earth. And and so as he as the motorcade uh, takes. Um, uh, his his remains past uh, th these places that mean so much to him uh, in Washington. Um, we should just remember that he was he he was an elder statesman who who, who really never uh, never got old, never lost that young drive, that young spirit, that young passion that motivated him in 1961 to get on that bus uh, and that motivated him until the day he the day he passed away as we look at the empty roadway on the other side and we watch uh, from the view from the uh, motorcade the funeral procession uh, making its way into dc i want to bring in uh, andrea mitchell who has certainly covered washington for a very long time and i want to you know andrea we, we talk about what a fighter uh, John Lewis was, uh, how brave he was. Certainly as a, a member of Congress, he didn't necessarily face physical harm, but he still stood up in, in many ways and showed that same fire in his belly. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, he was not uh, shy about calling anyone out, but also was always trying to bring people together. So he was fighting for the cause. And you think today he's going to, his remains are going to go past the National Museum of African American History. That was long sought by black Civil War veterans. And for decades and decades, it was just not imagined. He actually got the legislation through. He fought for that. That was such an important thing. And then it was carried out, of course, uh, by a great black historian, Lonnie Bunch. And the money was raised privately. And now it's part of the Smithsonian. But there are so many aspects to this, and that is right near the, the National, the Washington Monument on the Mall, in a, a, a spot of privilege. I'm also thinking, of course, as he fought for the Martin Luther King Day and for the Martin Luther King Memorial. And that memorial, when they pause briefly there, I'm recalling an interview that I did with him when the memorial was about to be dedicated in August of 2011. And what he told me in the interview for NBC was, it is wonderful, it is so moving to visit the mall and see this memorial to MLK Jr. He's standing between Jefferson and Lincoln, between the two memorials. To have a man of peace, love, and nonviolence on the mall, it's probably the first time in the history of our country to have someone never elected to public position, not a general, not a president, but a simple human being who lived and died for the cause of civil human rights. Connecting, of course, civil rights and human rights, and also so, uh, so relevant now when we're talking about memorials and who merits a memorial. He was a fighter, but also such a man of peace, as Martin Luther King III said, and always bringing people together. You will see the pictures in the 55th anniversary of not just Barack Obama, the first black president, but of course George W. Bush and Laura Bush as well, and in some of the other memorial pictures where he was crossing the bridge from Selma every, every year for that anniversary, you see Mike Pence behind him. And the vice president is expected to be one of the people who are going to pay tribute today, as well as we know uh, Joe Biden and Jill Biden are coming to Washington, an unusual trip from Delaware for them uh, to pay tribute. At the, at the viewing tonight. The other thing about this it's, it, that's so significant today is he is the first lawmaker to lie in state in the rotunda, which is reserved for heads of state, and most recently also for um, you know, other, other great leaders. But Rosa Parks was the first civilian to have that honor, the first black civilian in 2005. And uh, it, it's... It's significant that he is the first lawmaker to lie in the rotunda, not in Statuary Hall. 
And we watch the, uh, Andrew, thank you, we watch the uh, motorcade now. They have entered the, uh, the D.C. itself. We showed you a, a shot a moment ago. You could see the Martin Luther King Memorial uh, in, in the distance. That will be the first stop, first of about six or seven stops, I believe, uh, before reaching the Capitol. So and then there, there you see the, 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 the picture of the MLK uh, Memorial. Let me, as, as we wait for them to, to approach the memorial, let me bring in uh, Yamish Alcinder, White House correspondent for PBS NewsHour and NBC News political contributor. Uh, Yamish, always good to have you here. Uh, we, we talk about him being known as the conscience of the Congress. Through that lens, uh, describe what his loss, what the impact of his loss on just this functioning body of Congress. Well, as you say, he was the conscience of the Congress, and that really meant that he was pushing lawmakers to think about humanity, to think about not only just sitting in one side of the political aisle or the next, but really what was best for the country, what was right for the history of the country. Um, this was a lawmaker who, as you said, as you said, and who was, and that it's been noted, um, staged a sit-in when it came to gun violence because he was so moved by the idea that a that a man could try to kill and, and maim young um, people, who, homosexual people who were in a club in Orlando because he was so moved by the idea that all people, all people of that community, the LGBTQ community, should be treated equally and all Americans deserve better um, than having gun rights that were allowing such a thing to happen. So he was someone who was constantly pushing his fellow Congress people to really think through their missions when they came to Congress. He was also someone, as uh, as someone who covered him for a long time in the Capitol, um, he was someone who would stop and talk about the things that were going on in people's lives. So he was not only someone who was a congressman, but he was someone who was a human who would stop and talk to people. Um, and it was in some ways very interesting because I saw myself um, people really reacting to the fact that they were meeting this iconic national hero. And he would be congratulating people saying, I saw you doing something. It's so amazing that you're doing this. So he was someone who was super humble to his core. The other thing that I think is so fitting as he comes back to Washington and as he goes through and passes all these monuments to the great American heroes, there's almost no question. And I think in my mind and a lot of the people's minds that I've been talking to that he himself could easily be someone who could get a monument, who is easily someone who is who was a founder of this country in a sort of way because he was someone who didn't sign the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, but who really made all of those ideals um, come to life in his own actions. I also spent some time today reading through his original draft um, that he was going to give on the March on Washington, the one that he had to change because the older um, civil rights leader told him that it was too radical. In one section of that speech, he wanted to ask, I want to know which side of the federal government is, is the federal, federal government on. And I also want to make sure that we break free of political and economic chains. And I think when I think of the fact that he had this relationship with Black Lives Matter activists, they're asking those same questions that John Lewis was asking as a 23-year-old man on the March on Washington today. And he feel, he, he deeply understood that fact. And as a result, that's why you saw him um, still coming out as he was battling cancer to come out to Black Lives Matter Plaza, to to come out and lend his voice for immigration activists. He was someone that understood the power of Washington, but also stood the limit, understood the limitations and understood that if Washington didn't listen to the people on the street, that they were not doing their jobs. All right, Yamish, thank you. I want to bring in, as we're told, they're about five minutes away now from the uh, uh, MLK Memorial. Let me bring in uh, Martin Luther King III uh, uh, again. How fitting is it that this will be the first stop uh, this procession will make as it approaches the Capitol the, to coming to the MLK Memorial? Well, it is certainly uh, most, most fitting uh, because of their relationship and because uh, to a great deal, as already has been stated, he was largely responsible for helping to mobilize his colleagues uh, in Congress to get legislation so that uh, the King Memorial could be there. And uh, so amazing. He personified peace as dad personified peace. Uh, and, and so, um, in a sense, it always is challenging when one is talking about saying goodbye because it's, it's emotional. But it's certainly most appropriate uh, that, that, that the Martin Luther King site would be the first site uh, along with um, the uh, the memorial the uh, the uh, the Smithsonian the National Museum of, of History that he also 
was so importantly engaged in. Uh, when you think about a monument, one monument, all of these, there's one monument in relationship to per, a person, uh, but you talk about the history of a people, there's a museum that all Americans now will hopefully begin to understand the plight of what African Americans have gone through because it covers a vast amount of history of African Americans. And, and Congressman Lewis just so, so engaged in, in all of this history. And the final thing I would say is that maybe, uh, I'm, I know my dad and mom are smiling, are appreciating him, but I also know with this welcoming this that they had, there, there were so many foot soldiers that people just didn't know, but who gave uh, blood in their lives so that we would have the right to vote. For example, Viola Luisa lost her life in 1965. So uh, John Lewis, when he arrived, she welcomed him. And, and James Reeb, the list goes on and on of so many who are there and, and, and they're looking down and giving us inspiration to continue in this quest so that freedom and justice and equality does become real for all humankind. It is something we can achieve, but we've not yet done it. And, and I want to get your personal thoughts. You're, you're about to witness uh, the, the motorcade reaching your, your father's memorial. What, is, what goes through your mind at, at this moment? Well, I'm, I'm trying to fight off tears, quite frankly. Uh, I'm not a person who cries much, but I do cry in my own time. And so just this morning, during this whole process, I thought about a chapter that maybe some would say has closed, but then I think about the hope of a new chapter, as I say, with all of the, the young activists. But uh, to, to think about it, if I stopped and thought about it, I actually would be shedding tears, which I uh, will do, I know, at some point, and I've done and had a few tears that I've shed already, uh, but I want to make <laughs> Like well, I know it's, it's all part of a sense. It's, it's sad to see we. No. I'm sorry, we're caught in that uh, that interminable delay, uh, uh, ping pong back and forth. Uh, but uh, Martin Luther King uh, the third, thank you. We are watching the motorcade. And we're now just apparently minutes away from um, reaching that first stop, which is the MLK Memorial into the heart of Washington, D.C. Now, as you see, um, the congressman's body was flown uh, from uh, Alabama to Joint Base um, uh, Andrews, uh, where the body was then put in uh, the hearse you see before you and now making its way to the MLK Memorial. Uh, the idea is to stop at places along the way in D.C. that were significant historically or personally. Uh, to Congressman Lewis, and we will, uh, we've got cameras at all those locations. Uh, ultimately, he will arrive uh, at the Capitol, uh, where there will be another memorial uh, uh, for uh, private guests, and then the public ultimately will be allowed uh, to pay their respects on the steps of the Capitol to Congressman Lewis. It looks like a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. now as they make their way uh, uh, toward the memorial. As we await that, let me quickly bring in uh, Eugene Robinson uh, again. Eugene, what, what are your thoughts right now as we watch this procession make these significant stops? Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what we're about to see right now as he gets to the Martin Luther King Memorial, and it's, uh, it, it's difficult not to think about um, the, the relationship between the two men um, uh, he was, uh, John, John Lewis was, um, uh, surprised at, at one point to be, to be, uh, summoned to, to have a, uh, an audience with Dr. King or very early in his, in his career as an, as an activist, um, he had decided, uh, that there was a, a, a college, it was, um, uh, called Troy State College, I think, uh, near his hometown of Alabama, um, uh, that was whites only. He was not allowed to attend there. And he had in his mind uh, for a time that he wanted to integrate um, that college. And so he was asked to, to, to come and have a meeting with Dr. King uh, to, 
to um, to to be interviewed to see if he was the sort of person who could withstand uh, what what the early students who integrated those southern schools like Charlene, like uh, others, um, um, Vivian Malone at, at, at the University of Alabama, like 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 others had to had to face. It's a very very difficult road, and so so Dr. King uh, interviewed him, and and, uh, and eventually uh, uh, John Lewis decided that 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 wasn't his path. It, he he had a different path, and he went um, uh, to join the Freedom Riders and and and. We know a lot of the rest, um, but that was the beginning of this um, this, this long and uh, this long relationship that helped uh, helped really change the change the nation. I mean, it is it is hard to understate the impact that that uh, these men and women, uh, with their bravery, with their willingness to literally put their lives on the line. It's hard to, to overstate the, the revolutionary impact they had on this country. And uh, it was a, a special cause for uh, John Lewis to, to have this memorial for um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here in, in Washington. Uh, it was a long struggle, uh, both to, to, get, to get approvals, to to, to have the money raised, um, uh, to commission the, the, the artwork and everything. It is now one of the more visited um, uh, landmarks in Washington and its location on an axis between the memorials to Jefferson and Lincoln is deeply symbolic. Uh, it, is, it is one of the most um, peaceful sites in Washington uh, in the monumental core and I I often go there if I have a, a just a, even just a few minutes off just to sit and contemplate um, the, the greatness of that man and the greatness uh, of those um, who joined him in the struggle yeah definitely a place that uh, if you were in Washington it is uh, certainly worth worth visiting uh, as we watch the motorcade we're told that um, as they they go to these various locations in some places they will slow down some places they will pause we understand they will simply slow down as they uh, as the uh, motorcade passes the uh, MLK memorial but there you see near the top of your screen the bottom of your screen you can see uh, the motorcade now uh, approaching the MLK Memorial, and again, we expect it uh, to slow down. We'll hopefully get a picture now from the ground level in just a moment. As uh, this was a, a memorial, of course, that was hard fought um, uh, among its champions, uh, Congressman John Lewis. And another place that they will pass, the African American uh, Museum. Again, another memorial that he strongly wanted. And as we had expected, uh, the procession slowing down as it uh, reached the, the edge of the MLK Memorial. It will now proceed to 
the Lincoln Memorial actually looks like they looks like they had stopped there. But the Lincoln Memorial will be the uh, the next stop. This motorcade, by the way, uh, involves uh, 46, about 46 members of family, family and certainly close friends. And we see the procession now uh, uh, proceeding once again. Let me go to Kristen Welker, who is at the Lincoln Memorial, uh, awaiting the arrival of this procession. Kristen? Lester, let me just set the scene here for you. When Congressman Lewis's casket arrives here at the Lincoln Memorial, it will be met by a few dozen people who have come to pay their respects including a mother who brought her young African-American son to be here to witness this day, to pay tribute to a civil rights icon who, frankly, uh, made the world that we live in right now possible. And just to remember some of what Congressman Lewis said at the March on Washington in August of 1963, when he was just 23 years old, the youngest speaker to speak at the March on Washington. He had a very impassioned message Lester, he said, we must say, wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop and we will not and cannot be patient. Congressman Lewis was calling for change now. He did not want to wait for that change to happen. It bears repeating that some of the civil rights leaders who helped to organize the march, including Martin Luther King, were concerned that some of his rhetoric was actually too fiery, that it would undercut the movement's message of nonviolence. So they urged him to take out some of that language, including a reference to scorched earth. It underscores the fact, Lester, that there was a very practical element to the civil rights movement. They wanted change. And in order to do that, they had to communicate with the Kennedy administration. And so they felt that language that was too fiery could ultimately hurt their chances to get voting rights passed, to get civil rights passed. And so Congressman Lewis ultimately did temper his language, but his message was the same and just as impassioned that he wanted to see change and he wanted to see change happen now. And that fight for freedom and justice and equality was one that he would fight every day of his life until his final days. Uh, I had the honor of covering the 50th anniversary of his march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, when he was joined by the country's first African-American president, former president Barack Obama, President George W. Bush, who reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. And it was this iconic image to see Congressman Lewis holding hands with President Barack Obama as they marched across that bridge, that bridge that almost claimed his life when he was a young man. Of course, he risked his life for civil rights, and that is why he is being remembered in this way to this day. But when he spoke there at that 50th anniversary, Lester, his message was one about voting rights. He, former President Barack Obama, George W. Bush were deeply concerned that the Supreme Court decision of 2013 had gutted the Voting Rights Act. And so he really felt as though everything that he was fighting for was endangered. And here we see his casket arriving at the Lincoln Memorial, a very somber scene, Lester, as Congressman John Lewis stops here one last time. Lester. And, and we will pause and watch this moment.
As the procession now uh, slowly makes its way in front of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, let me bring in uh, Charlene Hunter Galt again. Uh, Charlene, I, I'm watching this and, you know, imagine that 23 that year old young man speaking to that march and that assembled crowd that, that, you know, that filled as far as the eye can see, and then, you know, watching the end here, his final journey past this spot. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about the last time you and I were together because we covered the anniversary of the march. And as I came over to where you were in a cart, there were two older white men wearing brown buttons that said 19, you know, the March on Washington. And I said, you were here? And they said, yes, and we had to come back. And that's what's so important about what you and so many are doing today, helping us remember history because so much of our history is lost. And I think that may be, that may account for some of the disagreements and misperceptions we have in this country. And I'm remembering when John did his Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates, and he found out that his great, great grandfather the first thing he did upon being emancipated was marry the woman he loved, one, and two, go out and register to vote. And this, 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 John just started to cry when he learned about this because he realized that this was in his DNA. And I think that this moment is so important historically, and I hope that it will lead to people going of all colors, races, and ages going into our history so that they can understand what our country really stands for and what it needs today to make the dreams of people like John Lewis and his grandfather come true. Well, John Lewis lived long enough to, to, to actually bridge history. And I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and the plaza that's been named recently in Washington, Black Lives Matter uh, Plaza. That is the next um, location the procession will pass by as it ultimately makes its way to the Capitol. Uh, let me bring in Jeff Bannard, who is at the plaza right now. Jeff, this this is a place with such significance, not only in, in what we're seeing now across across the country, but certainly, as I said, it bridges uh, John Lewis's life. Absolutely, Lester. And I have to, to set for you the scene here because so much attention has been paid to the details by Washington, D.C. officials, not just the new coat of yellow paint on this mural here behind me, not just the ribbons and bows adorning the sidewalk, but you also have city workers piping freedom songs here through a, 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 a public a speaker system. And just moments ago, we heard the speech that John Lewis delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial during the March on Washington, his voice really echoing down this corridor that leads straight to the White House. And, and to your point, yes, this is in so many ways a full circle moment. John Lewis, who helped give birth to the civil rights movement here in the U.S., and also helped validate, helped inspire the next generation of organizers, of demonstrators, those who uh, align themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement. And so in listening to your coverage today, I'm really struck by something that Bernice King wrote after John Lewis's passing. She mentioned that when he was left for dead on that Edmund Pettus Bridge, he got up, not just spiritually, but physically as well. And he did so without a hint of anger, without a hint of bitterness. And that he devoted himself even more fully to the cause of nonviolent protest. And that he remained a force of good. And that's even more so resonant now that we've seen this sort of tangible resurgence of racism in our, in our current politics. And so that, that is the real standard. That is the model by which he has inspired so many young activists and organizers, Lester. Yeah, Jeff, I understand that just moments away from, from reaching your location. Uh, we understand that, that Mayor Bowser is there. There will be some exchange of, of, of gifts. Can you tell us about that? Right. As we understand it, the mayor is going to meet with family members of the late congressman and exchange uh, some gifts. Her office also uh, called for the, the, the putting up the, of that 10 foot tall poster, uh, that picture that Congressman Lewis uh, took his last public appearance here on Black Lives Matter uh, Plaza. And so for the last few hours or so, we've seen people pay their respects and take pictures in front of that in front of that poster, Lester. All right, Jeff, thank you. And we watch uh, the, the view from within the procession itself now. Uh, the hearse carrying the, the casket of Congressman Lewis now making its way through these various significant locations historically and, and personally to, to the late congressman. And the next stop is, is obviously someplace 
that is uh, that's fairly new in, in, in Washington, D.C., and that is Black Lives Matter Plaza. We remember the day they came out and city workers uh, put those giant letters uh, on the street and, and renamed that plaza. And as Jeff noted, the, the sign uh, will be will be given to the family. And there's the high shot. Uh, um, and we've seen this replicated in other places, including New York. But uh, a, a, a huge statement, a uh, city that had, had seen uh, you know, significant protests. There's a uh, one of the last photos of, of uh, John Lewis uh, looking over uh, the plaza. Um, uh, a, a very, very dramatic scene, and uh, we expect a very emotional moment. Uh, as we've, we've noted that there is a, in all this, there is a symbolic passing of the torch, a warrior of the, of the, the fight for civil rights, uh, for uh, racial justice, for uh, voting rights, who uh, had such a significant imprint on history. Uh, his passing now, but a new generation has taken up this fight, and we see them in the streets of cities across America. Uh, and this, again, a bridge to those two moments in history, a struggle that never really end, ended, but one that has certainly found uh, a breath of, of fresh wind uh, because of the events we've witnessed over the last couple of months. And here again uh, is the, uh, the procession. They're passing by the White House right now. Just beyond the trees, the uh, old executive office building, which houses uh, many of the uh, White House functions and, and personnel, an extension, if you will, uh, of the White House. Eugene Robinson is with us. Uh, Eugene, how surprised were you uh, by the way Washington embraced the Black Lives Movement with this with this mural, this street mural? I was completely surprised. That uh, uh, Muriel, Muriel Bowser surprised a lot of people by just um, you know at the dark of night, what evening, beginning to paint this mural that's clearly directed um, at a, as, a, as a message uh, for the White House. I mean, this is, you know, it's the geography I think most people know, but this is right across Lafayette Square from the White House on the 16th Street axis, which goes all the way from the White House all the way to the very tip of the of the Washington, D.C. diamond miles away to the north. Um, so it's one of the most important um, streets in 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 this symmetrical layout of, of Washington uh, and uh, leads directly to the seat of power. Um, and and she was she was sending a message, especially after uh, this was right after that um, that that incident in which, <coughs> excuse me, peaceful protesters uh, near Lafayette Square had been cleared out of the way by, um, uh, frankly, violent um, federal forces who used tear gas and flash grenades uh, in order to clear the way for the president to have his photo up with uh, holding up holding up the Bible at St. John's Church. Um, uh, so here we're going to see some new history. Um, this this trip is really all about history and, and the fact that this is all history that every American should know. There is no American history without African American history. African Americans were here since 1619, 401 years since before the Mayflower. Before, long before this was a, this was an independent nation, uh, and have been uh, an integral and necessary part of the fabric and development uh, and and prosperity of this country from the beginning. And um, at some point, we'll go past the museum dedicated to bringing that home. But I think this whole trip brings it home and 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 shows that um, you, you can't make it a separate subject. It's all the same subject. It's American history. This is yeah. who 
we are as a nation. Yeah, Eugene, the um, the hearse has now reached Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. We'll note the music is coming from uh, uh, being piped in by the city there at the location. But let us, let us pause and, and take in this moment. Bowser uh, will be greeting the family and giving them a, uh, a memorial, a replica, if you will, of the Black Lives Matter Plaza sign. Uh, as we as we continue to watch events there, I want to bring in, uh, if I can, Congressman James Clyburn, uh, who is just fresh from um, uh, voting on the uh, renaming the Civil Rights Act. Can you tell us about uh, what's just transpired, sir? Well, thank you very much for having me, Leslie. Yes. We just had unanimous consent uh, approved by the House uh, to rename H.R. 4, the Voting Rights Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. We are sending that over to the Senate, and this afternoon uh, at the Senate, we'll take up legislation uh, to, they've got the bill, and they're going to put a little uh, correction on the bill to add John's name to it. And hopefully the Senate will take the bill up and pass it. Uh, because John worked on that bill for seven years. The, you know, the Supreme Court, uh, seven years ago, gutted the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act. That was an act that came out of Bloody Sunday. John March in March of 1965, across that bridge, was beaten near to, nearly to death. Uh, and as a result of that effort, uh, Lyndon Johnson in August of 65, signed the Voting Rights Act. Now, what we're trying to do is make the corrections. We've done it. The Supreme Court threw it out and told us what we need to do. John Lewis worked with James Sensenbrenner, and together uh, they uh, produced a product that's sitting over in the Senate, and I would hope that the Senate would take it up uh, so that we can uh, honor John Lewis in the proper way. All the words. It, it's it's here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just curious. What is your level of, of, of confidence? You say you hope that the Senate will take it up. What's your belief? Well, I wish I could say I'm optimistic, and since I'm not a pessimistic guy, uh, I've got the result to the scriptures here. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a parsonage. Uh, I learned from Hebrew 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. I don't see it, uh, but I got faith there's some evidence that it could happen. Yeah, Congressman Clyburn, uh, as, as you, I know you've been, you've been busy there at, in Congress, but can you just give us your thoughts on this day as the nation now takes this moment to remember um, your late colleague? What are, you, what are your thoughts? What's going through your mind? You know, John Lewis is what I don't know if he ever said it. I once read uh, more than once 
that Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French philosopher who came uh, to this country back in the 1830s, uh, once said that America is great because its people are good. And if America ever ceased to be, if the people ever ceased to be good, America will cease to be great. I've never been able to find that he really said that. But I believe that. And John epitomized the goodness of the American people. I have never met anybody who internalized nonviolence the way John Lewis did. And I believe this country and the world today have poised uh, to honor a good man. That's the best thing I can say about John. He was a good man, much better than almost anybody that I have ever met in my life. Has Congress <laughs> lost its conscience? I would hope not. Uh, I do believe that every now and then we need to sit down and take stock. And I think we're at a point in the Congress right now of taking stock. Uh, I believe that the American people uh, over the last several years uh, have really lost a lot of its goodness. And I've been telling people, I think that's what this election year is about. Uh, this election year is about restoring the goodness of America. You can't be a great country if you don't have good people running it. And so there are great uh, people in this Congress, but they have, for some reason, been smothered and lots of them just reluctant uh, to step up and to stand up. And I think that you've seen that more and more every day. I know I feel it. Uh, when I walk the streets, uh, when I talk to people, I see in the American people a restoration of the goodness that got to this country uh, where, it, where it is today. Well, Congress, Congressman Clyburn, Rob, really good to see you. Thank you for coming on and giving us the latest on, on that vote. We appreciate it. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. The procession uh, did, did make that stop at Black Lives Matter Plaza. We're told the exchange of gifts with Mayor Bowser happened out of camera range. They have now resumed uh, and are heading to the uh, National Museum of uh, African American uh, History. Uh, where they will simply uh, drive by. That, uh, an, another significant place in the story of, uh, of Congressman John Lewis, uh, we've talked about his tenacity, and uh, there's no better example of something that he fought for and came back every year to fight for and ultimately uh, 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 saw come into completion, this, uh, this fabulous uh, uh, museum. And, Andrea Mitchell, you, you told a little bit about that story uh, earlier, uh, but this was something that, uh, that he was a champion for. Some have called him the, uh, uh, the godfather of this museum, if you will. He was the godfather of the museum, as he was of so many other important moments in civil rights history in the country, in this country in recent decades. He fought for that museum, that privileged place on the mall, right near the Washington Monument, Lester. That was the, the hope and dream of black Civil War veterans. And then the late Congressman uh, Mickey Leland, who died in a crash in Africa, uh, had hoped to have it created, and he picked it up from Mickey Leland uh, from Mississippi and then made it a reality. And it was, as you've been referring to earlier, it was his tenacity, his fighting spirit, and the respect that he engendered that got that legislation passed, that and the MLK Memorial. But the museum is such an extraordinary collection. And it now has been realized by the first black head of the Smithsonian institution, which is all 17 museums. But he, Lonnie Bunch, created that museum uh, with this great team and then went on to lead the Smithsonian itself after the tremendous success. It is one of the most visited places, sought after tickets in Washington. And of course, all of the Smithsonian Institution museums so hampered by the pandemic. But it's wonderful that John Lewis and this procession, his hearse, is going by that notable location on its way to Capitol Hill. Uh, and again, when he reaches the Capitol, he will have the, the opportunity for him to be viewed by ordinary citizens who will come to the foot of the East Steps. Because of the pandemic, they can't go inside as they normally would when someone is lying in state.
but he will be the first black lawmaker to lie in the rotunda, uh, an honor accorded previously yeah. to others like John McCain and, of course, George W. Bush. Yeah, this, uh, this journey, this last journey for, uh, for the congressman through Washington will next take him by the Robert F. Kennedy Department of Justice building. It was uh, Congressman Lewis who introduced legislation that authorized the renaming of the DOJ building for Robert Kennedy. Uh, Ava DuVernay joins us now. She directed the film Selma, which featured John Lewis' story that day on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, Ava, uh, good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you spent a lot of time with the congressman in, in working on the Selma project. Uh, what were some of your takeaways? I did, and I'm emotional watching this, so may not be the best interview in this moment, but um, some of my takeaways was were a very, um, you know, uh, open, uh, flexible. I work with a lot of people on their real life stories and, you know, sometimes you come against a rigidity um, of folks uh, who just may not understand how storytelling works and the fact that you've got to kind of condense a life and events in a certain amount of time and, but not the congressman, you know, he said, I'm going to tell you how it went and you, then you tell the people. Uh, and he was always just very um, open uh, to the ways to get the story to people in whatever way worked for them. And I think that that's a big um, uh, part of his career. He was able to shift and move with different kinds of people, um, whether it's generationally, racially, culturally, politically. Um, and that's something that I saw from him up close in the storytelling around Selma. What did you learn about, uh, about Selma and, and, and that day from, from him? So many details. He gave me a lot of the detail um, as we talked about. We, we know a lot about the bridge crossing itself, exactly what he and um, uh, Isaiah Williams said to each other on the bridge, how they were feeling. Um, but the build up to it, you know, all of the events that led up to it, the fact that John Lewis and SNCC were actually in Selma before Dr. King arrived, the fact that they were invited uh, by Amelia Boynton, um, the story of Jimmy Lee Jackson and how his murder affected people, the story of James Reeb and his and his murder. And so just really to go through the, the, the sequence of events from a feeling place, not just from what I could read in a book. Um, and he was very generous with his time throughout the whole process. He came to the set. Um, and surprised us one day. He said, no, no, I'm not going to come to the set. You do your thing. And then one day he popped up and uh, we all just about fainted. He was generous and gorgeous and gracious and I'll miss him. Yeah, well, what struck me with him is he, uh, he was defined certainly in many ways by what happened in Selma, but he didn't rest on that. Did, did you get the impression that, that he wanted you to know and that, that He's still the fighter and, and still on so many other levels beyond that? You don't know, because when he talked about Selma, he never talked about himself. You know, he was always talking about the group, the collective, the family, what they all did as a community. So no time when I'm talking to the congressman did he uh, ever center himself, which was a great lesson as well. He was always talking about the group and the good for all. One of the things that I will say that, um, you know, it just strikes me about his life overall is... Um, all that we gained through his decades of lawmaking and, and what he's taught us um, individually as people who got to interact with him, but also what's been lost when you think of he was truly the only one, one of the few people from that time who is still living, um, who was able to uh, kind of rise to the full breadth of his uh, possibility and capability. There are a handful. You see uh, Ambassador Andrew Young, or Reverend C.T. Vivian, even an Angela Davis. But so many of our leaders from that time, so many of our great linkers from that time were, you know, uh, killed, imprisoned, exiled. And so uh, it makes, you know, the, 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 the wonder of him living 80 years and being a, a lawmaker for all of those years and a leader all the more remarkable. All right. Ava DuVernay, I know this is an emotional day. Uh, we really appreciate you, though, spending a few minutes with us and, and sharing those stories. They're, they're very meaningful, and, and we thank you. Thank you, Lester. And we have been uh, watching the procession, the motorcade. Uh, it uh, passed by the, um, the National Council of Negro Women. And next is going to pause, we're told, uh, in front of the Supreme Court. You see the Capitol certainly in the background, the ultimate destination. But uh, uh, there will be a pause at the Supreme Court, uh, which bears the words equal justice, 
under law. Um, those are the words uh, over the main entrance uh, to the court. And it is the ideal for which uh, Lewis fought his entire life. And again, one of the significant places that, that defines who he was and how he saw Washington, the instruments of power, uh, the instruments of change, the instruments of justice. So they are uh, about to make their way now in front of the Supreme Court um, before looping back to the U.S. Capitol. Um, where his, uh, his body will be received. My Washington geography is a little askew, but I believe it's to, to the right, uh, the court. This is the, the view inside uh, the rotunda where uh, his colleagues, uh, special invited guests, uh, will be there for a, a ceremony. The public will be able to uh, pay their respects on the outside, owing to the fact the Capitol is, is closed right now officially, as are so many public buildings in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, but we'll watch. There's the, um, you see the honor guards uh, in place there on the uh, east front of the Capitol. And the motorcade will be nearing that very soon. But first, again, making that pause at the Supreme Court. Okay, they apparently have to make a few turns uh, to, to get around to re actually reach... Uh, uh, reach the court. This is very. Uh, this is a, a day filled with such symbolism and 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 significance, and and not only the life of of this congressman uh, who was a champion, a warrior for civil civil rights and uh, and and justice, but but also for a country that is really confronting many of these issues on a different level, perhaps than it has in in recent years. Um, his story is part of a larger story, and as we've noted, the story of African Americans is part of the American story. And so, um, going by these various institutions, uh, not only speak to his life, but to, the, again, the instruments of power um, that have affected this movement. There's the Capitol off, off to the left as, as they make their way um, Forward. Let me bring in uh, Yamish. <coughs> excuse me, Yamish, uh, one more time. Uh, Yamish, have you given a lot of thought to, to these locations and, and the story that they ultimately tell? I have, and what I've been thinking about as we see the late Representative John Lewis going by these these institutions of power, I've been thinking about the fact that what he left behind was this legacy that um, that reminded people that the civil rights movement never really ended, that racism morphs and morphs and morphs, and that you have to continue to push forward with the human rights um, values of this country. So I think one of the things that I'm thinking about as he's passing the Congress, as he's passing um, the Supreme Court, he understood that this was a fight that was going to go on after he passed away. He understood that he that there was going to be generations of people after him that were going to have to carry the torch and do the things that he um, could no longer do as after he was gone. And I think the thing that I think about is the fact that he understood that even in modern day society, that there were going to be, there was going to be a fight for who could vote. There was going to be a fight for how to treat people equally. There was going to be a fight for political freedom for all people. So in this case, I think about the Supreme Court and I think about the Voting Rights Act that is, as as you've noted, and as Con Congressman Kleinberg noted, um, is still something that is in contention. So I think as we think about what the Congress has lost and what the America has lost, we can think about the fact that he himself would want the country to be doing so much more than it's doing right now. We are, of course, in this moment of racial reckoning, and he deeply understood that America was going to continue to have to really work on the flaws that allow people to not have equal access to voting power. The idea that there are votes still being suppressed to this day, that African Americans are still being targeted according to the courts with surgical precision when it comes to um, trying to suppress their ability to vote. So I think when I think of the congressman, I think of the idea that he was someone who continuously was telling people that to get into good trouble. So as he goes by the Capitol, as he goes by the Supreme Court, I just think that, they, that in the future, People are going to be looking at John Lewis and looking at all the things that he did, putting his very body on the line for freedom and knowing that he was doing things to be on the right side of history. So I think that's what is something that is is what made his life so remarkable. And I also think it's why he's getting this honor of being of being able to lie and rest at the rotunda, because he was someone who left the blueprints for how a good life, how a good man should live. 
All right, uh, Yamish, thank you. And again, the procession making its way to the Supreme Court and ultimately looping back to the Capitol. And that's where Garrett Hake is right now. Garrett, can you explain to us, uh, map out what, what happens once he reaches the Capitol? Sure, Lester. Once the motorcades arrives here outside the Capitol, uh, uh, the congressman's family members will be escorted inside and the congressman's casket will be carried up the steps here of the East Front by an honor guard here at Capitol Hill. They'll be met in the rotunda, the large rotunda, of course, at the center of the Capitol by a delegation of lawmakers, friends and family of the late congressman, although a smaller group than we might have seen in non-pandemic times. The Speaker Pelosi will begin the proceedings. She will give remarks. So, too, will Leader McConnell, the Republican majority leader of the Senate. And then something a bit unusual will happen. We will hear from the congressman himself, John Lewis, a recorded speech, a commencement speech that he gave at Emory University back in 2014 will be played, or at least a small portion of it will be played. We'll hear Amazing Grace. We will hear a couple of other songs. And then we will hear a benediction from Whip Clyburn, who you spoke to a short time ago, of course, a friendship with the late congressman that predates either of them even coming to Washington. Uh, Then other lawmakers, other invited guests will have an opportunity to pay their respects to Congressman Lewis inside the Capitol. It's only tonight after all that has wrapped up that the public will have an opportunity to pay their own respects. And like so many other things taken from us by this pandemic, so too is the opportunity to do so inside the rotunda in a more personal way like we saw uh, when Senator McCain, for example, lie, lay here in state. Instead, the Congressman's casket we brought out onto essentially the front porch here of the U.S. Capitol, the east front. And members of the public will have an opportunity to file by here uh, in the park just outside the Capitol, pay their respects from a distance, from outside here in the Capitol. Unless I can hear uh, the motorcade approaching us here near the outside of the Capitol, the Supreme Court, although I cannot yet see it. So I know they're close. Yeah, we just saw the uh, Supreme Court a moment ago uh, as uh, they make their way here and uh, make their way to where you are. And of course, we'll be we'll be covering the event. Speaker Pelosi, we should note, was also at uh, Joint Base Andrews uh, to greet the family and, and greet the casket of, uh, of of Congressman Lewis before the uh, beginning of the procession here. We've seen uh, people at various points along the way, uh, people who have gathered on the largely closed streets in Washington to pay their respects. You see a crowd there uh, forming on, on the left and the right, uh, people who are, you know, again, offering um, their thanks and acknowledgement for his life and, and the impact he's had on, on this country as the motorcade now makes its way, those final loops to bring it back to the east front of the Capitol where uh, that ceremony that uh, Garrett Uh, explained will take place and ultimately uh, the public will be allowed that social distance viewing that unusual setup uh, in a time of everything being unusual so this is um, this is the view Uh, they will pause at the at the Supreme Court we're told and here here they are This is actually the uh, the backside of, of the Supreme Court. And the procession now is resuming it again. It is just a very, very short distance to the Capitol itself, where we will uh, see his his casket removed from the hearse and taken into the rotunda of the Capitol itself. There's the, there's the map showing you the very short distance uh, to the Capitol. And we'll, uh, that camera should be in view in, in just a moment. Let me bring back uh, um, Martin Luther King III, who's uh, been gracious enough to join us for our coverage. Uh, thoughts you want to share, Martin? Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, um, it's amazing in one sense that this is his final journey where he actually, while he lived in the district here in Atlanta, 
but he also lived in Washington, uh, went to all of these sites. Uh, we, we see a, a leaving a, a, a courthouse where justice is supposed to be real, and yet he challenged us to consistently bring justice and truth and righteousness. And, uh, of course, um, his legacy will consistently reflect that. Um, but as he's approaching uh, the Capitol for his final services, um, I can only think about how sorely his leadership is going to be missed, his, his special touches. As, as I said, when I saw him often, whether it was in the cafeteria, when he walked throughout the Capitol, he always retained that common touch. He walked with kings and queens, but he retained the common touch. And it, he meant so much to so many of us around our nation and, and the world. And that voice will be heard. It will constantly be heard. Uh, one day we will have, as I say, or had said earlier, a freedom, a justice, and equality. And certainly uh, Congressman John Lewis and all of the phenomenal he made. I mean, if we think about it, you beat someone, and yet they get back up with love and forgiveness and unrelenting. Uh, God knows we need some of that in our discourse today. And the hope is that not only we will remember, but we will engage, we will become we will really create this union that we talk about as a perfect union that we can become, the America that ought to be. It's not yet what it ought to be, but we have to keep working on it. And all of us uh, should redouble, we quadruple our commitment to recreate uh, the nation that we ought to be because we are truly an amazing nation. And John Lewis, uh, shared that throughout his life. Uh, John Lewis knew that, and that's why he constantly challenged us to be the best of who we are and who we can become. Yeah, Martin, we're watching uh, the hearse now and a smattering of applause as the motorcade procession makes its way onto the Capitol grounds. And we're told some members of Congress uh, have been spotted wearing a uh, uh, masks that say good trouble, which of course was kind of what uh, the kind of trouble that uh, John Lewis lived by. Garrett, hey, can you give us some of the color at the, at the Capitol right now as the uh, motorcade arrives? Yeah, Lester, absolutely. I mean, we're beginning to see the motorcade arriving. And I can tell you that on some of the other balconies and in some of the sort of sectioned off areas here, we're seeing congressional staffers and members of Congress themselves sort of starting to gather to watch this, to be part of this moment. It's really difficult to, un to overstate uh, the impact that Congressman Lewis has on this institution and on the people in it. I mean, he was someone that when you came to Congress, you sought out, you wanted to meet, you wanted to get to know for members of Congress. You wanted to have him associated with the issues that you cared about. You wanted to have his voice to be the closer on an issue, whether it was on gun control or on other civil rights issues like same-sex marriage. He lent that voice out and built enormous goodwill for himself over the third of a century that he spent here. And you see that a little bit, and even at a time of pandemic when so few staff are present on the Hill, no tourists are here, this complex of buildings, this little city within the city of Washington, D.C. is largely shut down. Those that are here, that can be here, are coming out in scorching heat today uh, to take a moment to pay their last respects to an absolute legend of this institution. And you're seeing that today. Yeah, we're told the uh, motorcade is going to disappear out of view here shortly and there will be a, uh, some period of time, a pause, before uh, the ceremony itself begins uh, inside the Capitol. But let's watch and see how this, how this plays out.
As the honor guards uh, await uh, the family to uh, take their places, um, let me just quickly go to Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, as, as we watch this, and I think we're seeing members of the family now, as we watch this, uh, we're struck by this is a distinction, this is an honor that, uh, that very few Americans um, have. Indeed, uh, there have been a number of people in who have lied in state in Statuary Hall, but to go into the rotunda, uh, he is going to be the first black lawmaker to lie in state in the rotunda of the United States. This is, of course, the Lincoln um, catafalque. It is the place where presidents have lain in state. Um, Senator Hubert Humphrey, I seem to recall, certainly John McCain, and all of the U.S. presidents who have been accorded that honor, but not a lawmaker, not a black lawmaker. Rosa Parks, of course, was the first black civilian in 2005 to lay in state or in repose in Statuary Hall. But the rotunda under the dome is, of course, the most hallowed space in the U.S. Capitol. And that is reserved for a man who spent almost 34 years in this legislature in this House of Representatives representing uh, the people in Georgia and also the entire nation. He entered as such a young member of Congress and he was elected to Congress actually defeating one of his closest friends and colleagues in a bitterly, bitterly fought primary in Georgia, defeating Julian Bond. And it was really a, a separation of the two arcs of the movement because John Lewis was a street marcher. He was more of a, a fighter. He was one of the original freedom freedom fighters on the, um, on the buses. He had been arrested more than 40 times. Julian Bond was from another part of the Martin Luther King coalition. And so it was really extraordinary that he won that primary, a very bitterly fought primary. They did not reconcile for years and then came to Congress and became the heartbeat, the conscience of the Congress, leading both houses, really, at least as far as the Democrats were concerned, as the icon of civil rights and human rights. And as has been recounted, he was constantly renewing himself, uh, always rejuvenating and finding new causes, new ways to expand his reach, mentoring others. His great friend John, Jim Clyburn was on with you earlier. They were freedom marchers uh, back 60 years ago as young men, long before they both came to Congress. I remember of course, the 50th anniversary of the Martin Luther King speech, where he was at 23. John Lewis was the youngest speaker there, and it was so moving when they paused at the Lincoln Memorial uh, that one last time. And not only was he edited by Dr. King and others with his agreement, uh, it was always a, a collaborative effort, but he, he said afterward that he could not say no to Martin. And he realized that for the interests of the movement, he had to be more pragmatic. But in advance, he told me a number of years ago that they had sought a meeting with John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office through Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General at the time, and it's Nicholas Katzenbach, who had helped to desegregate schools. And they could not get that meeting before the march because the Kennedy brothers and the White House were so concerned it would not work peacefully. And it was only after, later that day, that they were assembled and brought into the Oval Office. And we see in the pictures that John Lewis was kind of hanging back because he didn't want to in any way interfere with Dr. King's moment. He was the youngest as the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he was then viewed to be the most radical, the most fervent. And that passion later became uh, even more important here in Congress because it was that passion that had him come up with the idea of a sit-in back after the Orlando nightclub shooting when he was pleading for gun reform and for something against gun violence for LGBTQ community. He was always thinking of human rights in the broadest possible way. And that is why he's called the conscience of the Congress and always will be. That's why he's being honored in this extraordinary way today. Speaker Pelosi loved him. Jim Clyburn as well, and all the other veteran leaders of this Democratic caucus. And so it's so fitting that today Jim Clyburn did get unanimous consent uh, from the House, those who supported him and loved him so much, for renaming the Voting Rights Act, 
which he believed, which was widely criticized for the Supreme Court gutting in 2013. They're trying to restore those sections, the key Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And uh, it is unlikely, as Jim Clyburn, while saying he's not a pessimist, he's an optimist, unlikely it'll ever get through either this Republican Senate or be signed by this president. But the hope is that in some future presidency that this will be the, the landmark legislation named after him, more important to him, certainly, than, mem than a memorial of any other kind, because it was for voting rights that they were on those buses, and it was for voting rights that they were marching into the armament on the other side of the bridge of the Alabama State Troopers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Lester. The uh, flag-draped coffin of, of John Lewis uh, appearing out of the open door of the hearse, uh, that motorcade uh, that accompanied the hearse, had, we're told, about 46 uh, members of family and, and close friends. I think we saw them exit a moment ago. And in a short time, the uh, honor guards will uh, take their position, the military honor guards will take their position and carry in the casket of, of John Lewis into the Capitol itself. Um, it's been an extraordinary uh, day so far with this tour, if you will, this final journey uh, for Congressman Lewis, uh, past places of, of huge significance, starting at the Martin Luther King Memorial. It was King who really ignited his passion in the nonviolent movement. He talked about it many times. Uh, it was, he was an incredibly influential person in his life and a, and a fitting place for him to start on that tour that uh, ended uh, with the Supreme Court. Um, a very significant journey and, and uh, some lesson in history there as Washington largely uh, coming to a stop today as streets were closed off for, for this procession. Uh, Thursday will be the celebration of life, the funeral uh, for John Lewis, but certainly this is uh, an, an important, a poignant uh, day to honor him, certainly for his colleagues in Congress to honor him. They are gathered in the rotunda right now. In a short time there will be a, uh, uh, a ceremony that will take place there ultimately his casket will be put on the steps of the East Front owing to um, the pandemic, and that is where the public with distancing guidelines in place will be able to pay their respects if they wish. And speaking of distancing, you can see the placement now of members of Congress, uh, how they will be seated in the rotunda for today's uh, ceremony. Um, we've, we've become quite used to, to pictures like this, and uh, we're told some of the um, some of the members who are here or gathering outside or wearing masks that say good trouble, uh, that their own tribute to something that uh, a phrase that, that John Lewis himself frequently embraced. And uh, as I said, their own form of, of tribute. Let me go to Kristen Welker right now. Kristen is at the, uh, the uh, Lincoln Memorial, one of the places that uh, that tour stop through. Uh, you had a story to tell about uh, kind of another side of, of, of John Lewis. Kristen? That's right, Lester. When we think about Congressman John Lewis, the man, we are reminded of his passion and love of life that in some moments was expressed through dancing. Uh, in one instance, one of his staffers posted a video of him dancing to the song Happy. And it went viral because it really showcased the extent to which he enjoyed life. He not only was someone who was a civil rights icon, someone who fought for rights throughout his life, but someone who was able to enjoy the more simple things in life as well. In fact, former First Lady Michelle Obama posted a video of Lewis dancing at an event for Stacey Abrams, who of course ran for governor several years ago. And she said, I'm awed by the way that in eight decades filled with such weight and consequence, he also managed to keep things simple and light. For him, the pursuit of lofty goals like justice and righteousness was about just doing what's right. And that's really the message, Lester, I think that he tried to pass on to this next generation of leaders. Uh, he campaigned and fought vigorously for people he wanted to see in power like Stacey Abrams. And he also, as we have discussed, ha really reached out to the younger generation. He had a, a joint event with former President Barack Obama in which the two spoke to some of the young protesters uh, who John Lewis was 
so proud of, so impressed by, the fact that they were such a diverse group, the fact that people were coming out of all races and ages and cultural backgrounds all across the country to demand change in the wake of George Floyd's death. And it was really a passing of a baton. And it was really that same passion that he brought to reaching out to that younger generation and that makes him such an inspiration uh, for all generations, Lester. And again, that moment where you see him dancing and just enjoying life just, I think, encapsulates the way in which he both enjoyed everything that was simple about life, even as he was fighting for these very complex, hard fought ideals. Uh, and he did fight for them into his final days. Uh, he was sick, of course, with cancer, and yet that didn't stop him from joining in that town hall with President Barack Obama one more time. Lester. Yeah, th thanks for sharing that, uh, Kristen. Eugene Robinson, I think, wants to join in here as well. Eugene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lester, I just want to say a, say a word about Congressman Lewis's incredible bravery. And, um, and we, we, we talk about that, but I think few um, Americans um, perhaps really understood what, what that meant. I mean, because few of us have deeply studied uh, the, the the movement led by um, uh, Mohandas Gandhi in in India, for example, that, that freed the the subcontinent from British rule. Um, uh, that that commitment of nonviolent confrontation. Uh, John Lewis did deeply study study that movement and studied that philosophy and and understood it and internalized it. And I am. I am just constantly in awe of the of the courage and the bravery that it took for him and all the others, including Amelia Boynton, Hosea Williams, all the ones who, who crossed that bridge and and who took the freedom rides and who did um, all the, the things that the that the, the civil rights um, movement um, leaders and members did, uh, going into situations knowing they would be attacked knowing they would be physically beaten um, having having had lessons in how to how to how to cover themselves up and and um, and try to avoid uh, injuries to the to the heads and other other vital organs but under no circumstances ever to fight back never to to raise the hand against one's attacker sit at lunch counters uh, segregated lunch counters and have food um, uh, dumped on on them and uh, uh, and and liquids and slop and and to have um, uh, at, at one point uh, during a sit-in um, the, the restaurant owner locked the doors and and had a fumigator start pumping in poison gas to kill uh, to kill um, pests and and so they were they were eventually rescued by compatriots who let them out but but the, but, but that sort of thing he had the commitment every day he went into um, one of those protests one of those demonstrations one of those marches marches to, if necessary, give his life, uh, and that is that is truly a ra a rare uh, kind of bravery um, that uh, that I just can't say enough about. I am in awe of it. I think the nation should be in awe of it. It was um, uh, he, he could have died um, a, a score of times during the. The civil rights movement, and it, it is our great fortune that he was able to survive. Um, uh, but it's because of this unshakable philosophical belief that nonviolence was was the way to achieve freedom and justice. Yeah, it, it is. A, I'm, I'm glad you laid it out that way. It is a remarkable, remarkable legacy, uh, Eugene. Uh, Kelly O'Donnell is on Capitol Hill. She's covered the congressman for a very long time. I want to hear your thoughts, Kelly. Good afternoon, Lester. I'm struck by listening to Eugene and talking about the bravery of John Lewis. I've always been struck by the combination that is rare in public officials of a fearlessness and a kindness in the same person, in a person that we would seek out for comment and who would be at the forefront of newsmaking events. That combination you didn't see very often here, and it was enduring with John Lewis. 
he would be the one willing to, of course, through his younger years, do all of those things where he spilled blood for the cause. But even on Capitol Hill, in the more uh, ordinary ways of legislation, always putting his elbows out where they needed to be and to come back to issues like establishing the African American Museum, which he introduced every two years from the 1980s until in the early 2000s when he had a partner in George W. Bush to sign that into law and to make the museum a living, breathing institution now. I've also always been struck in talking with John Lewis how he would ask us, how are we? What do you think? What's happening with you? And it wasn't just lip service. He was actually interested in connecting with people. As he would walk into a space here on the Capitol and everyone would be sort of taken with his stature, uh, a rather short man, but an enormous stature, a quiet man, but a very bold personality based on what he had done. And when you'd see him interact with tour groups or visitors or others from the other party, he was always willing to talk and listen. Now that's not to say he wasn't a fierce partisan too. He was. He worked hard to raise money for Democratic candidates and he would be in photos with Republicans, which was often a benefit to them. But he was the kind of person who on issue after issue uh, would be a kind voice to speak to. And covering lots of politicians over the years, that combination of gentleness, kindness, and the fierce passion for his ideas in one person was truly unusual. He was very kind to me one day when we were in his office talking about Rosa Parks when a statue to honor her was being set here at the Capitol. And he went through so many of his personal mementos talking about his love for her. And I was so struck by realizing here I am talking to John Lewis, a sitting member of Congress and a figure of generations, talking about this historical figure she had passed on, Rosa Parks, and realizing you know, the, the humanity of these two people and the real relationship and friendship they had. And he shared those kinds of personal details. And you can imagine, Lester, throughout his life, people would always want to ask him about those things, to see notes from Martin Luther King Jr. that were a part of his office, all those personal things. He was very generous in offering that as a way to keep people interested in his causes, but it really spoke to his gentle spirit and his kindness. Lester? Hey, hey Kelly, how was, he, how was he viewed on the other side of the aisle? There were many Republicans who would want to be in proximity to John Lewis on certain occasions to their benefit. But there were times where people thought he was too partisan on issues. He chose not to attend the inauguration of this president, President Trump, saying he believed he was illegitimate. He also did not go to the inauguration of George W. Bush. And later it was Barack Obama and George W. Bush walking with John Lewis on the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. So their relationship was repaired. John McCain, who I covered for a long time, had a good relationship with John Lewis, but in 2008 there was one point where Lewis sort of called out the McCain-Palin campaign concerned about some of the rhetoric. And John McCain was deeply saddened by that. And they were able to repair that. And Lewis said he was not suggesting that it was John McCain being like George Wallace, but a call to be concerned about rhetoric. Much of that feeling from John Lewis was about his criticism of Donald Trump, who, as you know, uh, has not really participated in any of these events. He tweeted that he was saddened by the passing, that he and Melania were saddened. But he has done very little to acknowledge the passing. And in some ways, we've seen Trump just stay away from these sorts of events. But the relationships with other yeah. members on the Republican side were genuine, and they were a part of the day-to-day -day business of Congress. And there was a lot of respect. There were times where he was viewed as a, a hardened Democrat in, in the day-to-day -day of life. But you will hear many Republicans now acknowledge his ultimate service and sacrifice and speak in their own way about their moments of interacting with him. So in that way, he was a larger figure going above the day-to-day -day politics. Yeah, Kelly, thank you. Let's go back to Kristen Welker. Uh, Kristen, and you've got some stories about his relationship with Barack Obama. 
In many ways, Lester, Congressman John Lewis had a very special relationship with the country's first African-American president. And in recent interviews, when he was asked about Obama, he would get emotional just thinking about it because he really saw his presidency as a part of and a product of him risking his life so many years ago. There's a wonderful story from the first inauguration of President Barack Obama when Congressman John Lewis asked Obama to sign a photograph of the inauguration. And former President Obama wrote, because of you, John. So incredibly poignant uh, and incredibly uh, underscores the relationship between these two men. The fact that the former president really looked to Congressman John Lewis as paving the way for him uh, to become president. But that was really just the beginning of this special relationship. Of course, uh, the two would go on to work together on health care, uh, to work together to fight against gun violence, to try to get stiffer gun laws passed, and of course, voting rights. We keep coming back to that central issue because it was so central to the legacy of John Lewis. And it was one of the centerpieces during the 50th anniversary when the two went to march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, again in Selma. And again, they clasped hands as they walked across that bridge. They were also joined by former President George W. Bush, as Kelly said, who reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. All of them deeply concerned about what they saw as a threat and an assault to voting rights in that 2013 decision by the Supreme Court. And so all of those leaders talked about the importance of voting rights at that 50th anniversary. So I think what we saw was a real partnership between Obama, between John Lewis. And in his final days, he joined Obama with that virtual town hall, speaking to young people, trying to energize them to become the next generation of civil rights activists. And his message for them was powerful. He said they're going to help redeem the soul of America and save our country and maybe help save a planet. He saw them as the continuation of the work that he started so many years ago, Lester. Kristen Walker outside the Lincoln Memorial there in Washington. Uh, as we uh, await uh, the honor guards to uh, approach the, the hearse and bring out the casket of, of John Lewis, as we said, the family and, uh, and special guests, uh, we believe, have already been escorted in the Capitol. Let's go to Garrett Hake, who might have a better uh, handle on, on where we are and what's to come. Garrett? Lester, we're just still awaiting the start of these uh, events here today, getting finally family members seated, members of Congress seated, getting the entire rotunda set up and ready to operate, essentially waiting on a cue from the sergeant at arms for the Capitol there at the top of the stairs that things are ready to begin inside. Uh, and I think we may be seeing that here shortly when this honor guard will begin uh, the proceedings here. Once we do get inside, the first person we'll hear from is the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, of course, a comrade in arms of Congressman Lewis. For, for decades in their combined service. We'll also hear from the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who uh, you know, had high praise for Lewis at his passing, but who is certainly no ally of his politically. And I think one of the things that makes this all interesting today and uh, even more unusual than all of the coronavirus elements to it is that we'll hear from the congressman himself, a several minute long excerpt from a speech he gave at Emory University, a commencement from a few years ago. And, I think that links for me the importance of some of these other more gestures that may seem symbolic from earlier in the day, like the renaming of the Voting Rights Act after John Lewis. Uh, that's not for his benefit. That's for ours. And that's to get us talking about why something like that is so important and so necessary even now. And Lester, I'm going to stop talking now because I see uh, the sergeant at arms and members of the family out on the steps of the East Front. All right, Karen.
good. We, uh, it, it appears uh, a member of the uh, military honor guard has um, has fainted or uh, otherwise been disabled and uh, being tended to right now. Um, told it's a very very hot day in Washington D.C. Whether that's related, I certainly don't know. But right now, that's the immediate. Uh, immediate uh, attention is to that in, that individual. Uh, Garrett, do you have a view uh, from where you are and better handle what's do. happening? I do. Yeah, Lester, this military honor guard has been out here in their dress uniforms for going on at least an hour, essentially standing at attention. And uh, a service member, I think in a white Navy uniform, is the one who uh, just fell out of line and down onto his back. He's being attended to now by members of the uh, Capitol Police who rushed over with bottles of water and uh, appear to be taking care of him. I'm trying to get a better look to see if he's moving or if there's any clear indication that uh, he's awake and communicating. It does seem to be the case. They're giving him bottles of water now, as I can tell. But uh, just as it looked like things were getting ready to go here, oh, good, and now they're helping him back onto his feet. So uh, a bit of a scary moment here and, and some applause now coming from the folks who are gathered around here to see uh, this service member back up on his feet, Lester. Well, that, that's good to see. Uh, these are, uh, you know, re representatives of all the uh, members of the service, and this is a, uh, well, we call them honor guards, and it certainly is an honor to be among the, the troops who are able to participate in these sorts of uh, tributes and honors. So we wish him well, uh, that member of the honor guard who is being uh, carried away. We were just about at that point, we believe they were going to uh, file over to the hearse. The uh, sergeant at arms had, had gathered out on the steps to officially welcome the body of John Lewis. And I hear the honor guards now. Step. Ready, 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 step. 
Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Ready, step. Forward, watch. Mark on. Bears, walk. Center, fix. Side step, walk. few minutes the uh, ceremony will begin led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and uh, members of the family and, uh, and uh, special guests now filing in as well to take their places and, and once everyone is, is seated this uh, ceremony will take place. This is part of a, a week of, of moments um, honoring the life of Congressman John Lewis. Garrett Haake is, uh, is there for us. Garrett, uh, how many members of Congress, do we know how many members of Congress are actually there or will be there? We should have a few dozen members. The Congressional Black Caucus and close friends of the congressman will be in the rotunda as this begins in earnest throughout the course of the day. Any other members who want to come in uh, and pay their respects privately will get an opportunity to do so after. Forgive the uh, motorcycle noise. The motorcade is starting to leave the east front of the steps here. Uh, but yeah, the, the Congressional Black Caucus members have sort of priority access here, if you will. They'll be, they were especially invited for this purpose. And I think also important to note that Congressman Clyburn, the, the whip, whose friendship with Congressman Lewis predates either of their service in Washington, going back several decades, will give the benediction at the close of the sort of formal proceedings inside the rotunda. And only after that, after the family has departed, will other members of Congress who are back in town, uh, the Senate really just arriving for business even later this afternoon, have a chance to come in and pay their respects in private in the rotunda before the congressman's body is moved back out onto the uh, east front steps for the public viewing later this evening. All right, as we uh, wait for this begin, I want to bring back uh, Charlene Hunter Galt, a journalist, a longtime friend of Lewis. Uh, Eugene Robinson was speaking a bit earlier about the, the incredible courage of John Lewis that was exemplified at, at many points in, in, in his journey. But I want you to talk a little bit about, if you can, moral courage. And that's, that's something that is, is called upon more, I guess, perhaps today. Well, I think his moral courage stems from his faith. And, you know, I'm a kid, just like my former colleague, Glenn Eichel, who's now with John, who's from the land of the ancestors. And he believed that he was doing what God wanted him to do. And what I think is important about today is that it is really 
with all of the testimonials keeping hope alive. And while I agree with everything uh, uh, Martin Luther King III said, I don't agree that this is John's final journey because he went to South Africa like I, he learned about the ancestors. He's now an ancestor along with Mandela and Susie Vivian and Salah and Fanny Hamer. And I believe that that spirit that kept him going is going to help restore the, the image of America in the world who is suffering right now. But when we hear about John's belief in the promise of this country, I think that that's going to help restore the image of America in the rest of the world. It's suffering now. But today we are being reminded of America's promise and the fact that this journey along the moral arc of the universe is long, but it does bend towards justice. And that's what John believes in. And I think that's what today is going to tell the world that we all need to follow the faith of John and believe in the promise of this country, however challenging it can be at times. Martin, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yeah, uh, Martin, Martin Luther King III, yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I just want to get your thoughts on this, on this idea of, of moral courage that, that you know, we need so desperately. Well, was the question, uh, I, I'm sorry, I stepped away for a second, so I didn't actually hear the question. Yeah, I mean, we're just talking about, uh, we, we talked about the incredible physical courage uh, of John Lewis throughout his, his life, certainly during the struggle and certainly uh, in, during his years in Congress, but the importance of his moral courage and that that not be overlooked. Well, you know, um, there's no way that one can or society will or history will overlook uh, the moral courage that he demonstrated over and over and over again. And not only is it an, an example for us, uh, but, but, but it, is, it is really an, an affirmation uh, when we look at what is going on in our world right this moment uh, and what will happen. Um, you know, in generations yet to born. The fact is, I mean, they, they are high school students who are now engaged in nonviolent demonstrations. Uh, we often saw college students, but now they're high school students in Berlin. And that is certainly part of the legacy of John.
Wenn ich sie sehr noch nicht. Wir wollen wohl den Sieg benutzen. Sieg. Ich habe die ganze Zeit gesagt, dass ich das nicht wissen. Good afternoon. It is an official, personal, and very sad honor to welcome our colleague, John Lewis, back to the Capitol, to welcome his family and his many friends to acknowledge his sacred life. Please stay standing for the invocation by Dr. Reverend Dr. Granger Browning, Jr., Ebenezer AME Church. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, I come before you today in the name of Jesus, thanking you for the many different faiths and beliefs and religions that make up your beloved community that come to celebrate the life and the legacy of John Lewis. We come today thanking you for the faith foundations that his mother and father established in Troy, Alabama. We thank you for his leadership of SNCC and the March on Washington. We thank you for how he was bloodied for us, bruised for us, he marched for us, sat in for us, and was willing to give up his life that we might have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And on today, as his colleagues and friends and especially family members come as he lays in state in this hallowed rotunda, we come on this day recommitting ourselves to march as he marched to ballot boxes and to this year for mailboxes and for voting rights and for civil rights and for human rights. And we'll keep doing that until that day justice rolls down like mighty waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And finally on July 17th, we want to say thank you that he crossed another bridge, not the Edmund Pettus Bridge that we pray that one day will be named the John Lewis Memorial Bridge, but the bridge from earth to glory. And when he got there, Elijah Cummings and the congressional a cloud of witnesses welcomed them home as they marched down that street paved of gold. We want to say thank you from Emmett Till uh, to George Floyd, said thank you for allowing our deaths not to be in vain. And when he got to the lily white throne, we want to say thank you. He heard you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have done the good fight and you have uh, kept your eyes on the prize and now enter into the joy of the Lord. And after you said that, Gabriel told the angels to lift every voice and sing. And we heard Dr. King in the background saying, free at last, free at last. The consciousness of Congress is free at last. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gentlemen, the Honorable Mitch McConnell, Majority Leader of the United States Senate, Please be seated. In his memoirs, John Lewis described a childhood home that was quite different from the place he lies today. That farmhouse in Pike County, Alabama had no running water or electricity it stood on the first land his father's family had ever owned in a part of the country where segregation had led to almost total isolation along racial lines. It would have been hard to conceive back then that the young child tending his family's chickens would by age 23 be leading the movement to redeem American society that he'd be addressing hundreds of thousands of civil rights marchers from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I was lucky enough to be there that day. I marveled at the massive crowds. The sight gave me hope for our country. That was John's doing. Even on that day, as his voice echoed across the mall, I wonder how many dared imagine that young man would come to walk the halls of the Congress. America's original sin of slavery was allowed to fester for far too long. It left a long wake of pain, violence, and brokenness that has taken great efforts from great heroes to address. John's friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., famously said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But that is never automatic. 
history only bent toward what's right because people like John paid the price to help bend it. He paid that price at every Nashville lunch counter where his leadership made segregation impossible to ignore. He paid it in every jail cell where he waited out hatred and oppression. He paid that price in harassment and beatings from a bus station in South Carolina to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. John Lewis lived and worked with urgency because the task was urgent. But even though the world around him gave him every cause for bitterness, he stubbornly treated everyone with respect and love. All so that, as his friend Dr. King once put it, we could build a community at peace with itself. Today, we pray and trust that this peacemaker himself now rests in peace. All of John's colleagues stand with his son, John Miles, their family, and the entire country in thanking God that he gave our nation this hero it needed so badly. May all of us that he will leave behind under this dome pray for a fraction of John's strength to keep bending that arc on toward justice. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. To the family of John Lewis, welcome to the Rotunda. Under the dome of the U.S. Capitol, we have bid farewell to some of the greatest Americans in our history. It is fitting that John Lewis joins this pantheon of patriots resting upon the same catafalque of President Abraham Lincoln. John revered President Lincoln. His identification with Lincoln was clear 57 years ago at the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial where John declared, our minds, souls, and hearts cannot rest until freedom and justice ex exist for all people. Words that ring true today. Mr. Leader, I too was there that day. Our student years. Between then and now, John Lewis became a titan of the civil rights movement and then the conscience of the Congress. Here in Congress, John was revered and beloved on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the Capitol. We knew that he always worked on the side of the angels, and now we know that he is with them. And we are comforted to know that he is with his beloved Lillian. And may it be a comfort to John's son, John Miles, and the entire Lewis family, Michael Collins, the entire staff, that so many mourn their loss and are praying for them at this sad time. God truly blessed America <clears throat> with the life and leadership of John Lewis. We thank you for sharing him with us. May he rest in peace. John Lewis often spoke of a beloved community, a vision that he shared with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., of the community connected and uplifted by faith, hope, and charity. And indeed, John had deep faith, believing that every person has a spark of divinity, making them worthy of respect. And he had faith in the charity of others, which is what gave him so much hope. And he read, as he wrote in his book, release the need to hate, to harbor division and the enticement of revenge. Release all bitterness, hold only love, only peace in your heart, knowing the battle for good to overcome evil is already won. John the Optimist. Through it all, John was a person of greatness. He also was a person of great humility, always giving credit to others in the movement. John committed his life to advancing justice and understood that to build a, a better future, we had to acknowledge the past. Exactly one year ago, it was a privilege to be with John and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, Madam Chair, Karen Bass, to, to, on a pilgrimage to Ghana 
to observe 400 years since the arrival of the first slaves from Africa. Some of the descendants of those slaves would build this capital where John Nye lies in state on the Lincoln catapult. I wish you could have seen the uh, response that John received when he was introduced to the Ghana parliament. My colleagues are shaking their heads. It was overwhelmingly, overwhelming. But I wish you could have seen him at the door of no return, which enslaved people were sent through onto the uh, death ships to cross the Atlantic. I wish you could have seen what it meant to him. He knew that the door of no return was a central part of American history, just as was the, is the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the March on Washington, the Selma March to Montgomery Arm. When John made his speech 57 years ago, he was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington program. How fitting it is that in the final days of his life, he summoned the strength to acknowledge the young people peacefully protesting and in the same spirit of that march, taking up the unfinished work of racial justice, helping complete the journey begun more than 55 years ago. We have all seen the photographs of John being brutally beaten in Selma, which painted an iconic picture of injustice. What a beautiful contrast to see John and the mayor of Washington is with us today at the Black Lives Matter Plaza, standing in solidarity with the protesters, an iconic picture of justice that will endure and will inspire a nation for years to come. John firmly focused on the future, on how to inspire the next generation to join the fight for justice, and his quote, to find a way to get in the way. As one of the youngest leaders of the Freedom Rides, March on Washington, as I said, and March to Montgomery, he understood the power of young people to change the future. When asked what someone can do who is 19 or 20 years old, the age that he was when he set out to desegregate Nashville, Lewis replied, a young person should be speaking out for what is fair, what is just, what is right. Speak out for those who have been left out and left behind. That is how the movement goes forward, John said. Imagine the great joy he had traveling the country to share that message of action with young people. No need to imagine. It is my personal privilege right now for me to yield to our beloved colleague, the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Congressman John Lewis. I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was only four years old, my father had saved $300. And with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family is still on that land today. How many of you remember when you were four? <laughs> Now, what happened to the rest of us? It was many, many years ago when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham. I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. 1957, I met Rosa Parks at the age of 17. In 1958, at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And these two individuals inspired me to get in the way, to get in trouble. So I come here to say to you this morning, on this beautiful campus, with your great education, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. <laughs> Mm 
use your education. You have wonderful teachers, wonderful pe professors, researchers. Use what you have. Use your learning. Use your tools to help make our country and make our world a better place where no one will be left out or left behind. You can do it and you must do it. It is your time. In a few short days, we will commemorate what we call the Mississippi Summer Project. For more than a thousand students from all over America, many from abroad, made a trip to Mississippi to encourage people to register to vote. And the summer night of June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, two whites and one African-American, Nicholas Werner, Andy Goodman, and James Shaney, went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church that was used for voter registration workshop. These three young men, detained by the sheriff, taken to jail, taken out of jail, turned over to the Klan where they were beaten, shot, and killed. And I tell students today, these three young men didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East or Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Africa or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to help all of our citizens become participants in the democratic process. As young people, you must understand that there are forces that want to take us back to another period. But you must say that we're not going back. We made too much progress and we're going forward. There may be some setbacks, some delays, some disappointment, but you must never ever give up or give in. You must keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. That is your calling, that is your mission, that is your moral obligation, that is your mandate. Get out there and do it. Get in the way. In the final analysis, we all must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. We all live in the same house. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian, American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people, we are one family. We all live in the same house. Be bold. Be courageous. Stand up, speak up, speak out, and find a way to create the beloved community, the beloved world, a world of peace, a world that recognizes the dignity of all humankind. Never become bitter, never become hostile, never hate. Live in peace. We are one. One people and one love. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Whitley Phipps.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Whitney Phipps.
God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until you are escorted to pay your respects by the Sergeant at Arms. A uh, brief ceremony in the presentation of wreaths. Uh, this is the beginning of the departure now. The, uh, the family will be escorted to the casket to pay their respects. I believe that's his son, John Miles. Next, we expect congressional leadership to file past the casket and pay their respects.
As the congressional leaders uh, exit the rotunda, the uh, rest of the invited uh, audience will be able to pay their respects as they leave. I want to bring in uh, Garrett Hake, who is at the Capitol right now. Uh, as we expected, a brief, uh, rather simple ceremony there. Uh, what happens next? Next, other lawmakers who are not able to be part of this official ceremony here. You can see from that vantage point above how much less crowded the rotunda is than we've seen when other lawmakers have lied and stayed in recent years. Those other lawmakers uh, will have a chance to come by privately and pay their respects to the late congressman in the next few hours. He'll remain inside the Capitol itself during that time, only after those other lawmakers and, and other guests have privately had that moment will the casket be moved out onto the east front in the evening, hopefully after this heat breaks around 6 o'clock tonight, when members of the public who can line up outside will have the opportunity to pay their respects uh, from a socially distant perspective. They'll be only allowed to approach as close as the base of the stairs on the east front. Again, just one of those other changes that we've had to see put in place here in the Capitol in the wake of this pandemic, as you can continue to see now more lawmakers filing past uh, John Lewis's casket here for the final time. Yeah, we note uh, not a lot of social distancing there, but everyone masked as they uh, as they step forward to pay th their respects. Let me bring in Andrea Mitchell right now. Um, uh, Andrea, I, I spoke with Kelly O'Donnell a bit earlier. We talked about um, John Lewis's role in Congress, how he was perceived, his respect, uh, how he was seen on the on the other side. Um, do you want to reflect on that as well? Absolutely. Kelly is so right. He had so much respect on the other side, but also frustration, the divide over politics, over civil rights, voting rights, because the Republican Senate standing in the way for his dream of getting the Voting Rights Act amended to deal with the constitutional issues that the Supreme Court invalidated in 2013. He wanted that restored. That is the Voting Rights Act that Jim Clyburn renamed today unanimously accepted by the House, sent over to the Senate, and no expectation that that's actually going to be done this year. They are hoping, if there is a change of administration, that that could be led and enacted and signed into law by the next president, but it certainly would not be done under this president. We see there, as the, as the camera is panning, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's been fighting for voting rights for statehood for D.C. She was one of his colleagues in 1963 in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and has been at his side ever since, a member of Congress for many, many decades, but of course, uh, 17 terms, in fact, but not ever being able to vote because the District of Columbia does not have a voting representative. But that is one of, the, one of the things that he fought for as well. And as you see them panning the members of the Black Caucus, who, whom he led spiritually, uh, Karen Bass, of course, is now the leader of the Black Caucus and is on Vice President Biden's shortlist for vice presidential running mate. So many things have changed in the Democratic Caucus with the rise of women in the caucus and black women in particular, the leadership that we've seen since the 2018 election and in the years before that of a rising number of black members of Congress, female members of Congress from both both generations, from many generations now, as well as, you know, the young squad. And we've seen the AOC uh, firebrand as one of the youngest members. There you see Joe Kennedy. Congressman Joe Kennedy, who's running in a very bitter primary in Massachusetts right now against Ed Markey. And those are the kinds of divides that really seared the soul of John Lewis, because I remember interviewing him the day that he endorsed Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton. And he said, to me that day in his office that that decision to go against Bill and Hillary Clinton was one of the most painful of his life because they had been such friends, but he could not not turn his back on the prospect of the first black American president and the first black nominee. So that was in the bitter primary battle of 2008. So he's a man of politics, right. very pragmatic, but aspirational and always full of hope and dreams. Let me bring in Eugene Robinson right now, a Washington Post columnist, NBC News political analyst. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, in your view, how much does John Lewis's name carry forward in this fight for voting rights, uh, this fight against uh, voter suppression in, in the environment we're in? Does, does his name still carry some weight in this? 
I think it does carry weight, uh, Lester. It, it, first of all, now it graces the legislation um, that, uh, that the House has, has passed and, has, and proposes to, um, to, to, to rectify some of the damage done to the Voting uh, Rights Act by the, by the Supreme Court decision. Um, in uh, in 2013, but um, you know, I, I can't I can't talk about uh, John Lewis without um, without telling the truth. And so the, the the truth is that I think he would, if, if he were still with us, he would have been moved by the ceremony and gratified by the ceremony and and heartened by the by the words that were spoken, including the words that were spoken. Uh, by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who um, reminded us that he had attended the, the March on Washington in 1963, and he had really beautiful words to say about John Lewis and about the struggle for um, uh, for justice and equality for all Americans. And I believe Congressman Lewis uh, would would be asking him, "So why are you not allowing a vote?" on the new Voting Rights Act. Um, why do you continue to block that? Uh, and um, uh, I, it, he was direct in that way, and he was uncompromising in that way, and, and um, he, he kept his moral compass um, fixed on true north, and I think that is the true north of his compass, uh, that, that, that all Americans should have, um, have access to the to the ballot box should be able to vote for their their representatives, and that efforts to 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 pre prevent any American from voting are are not just illegal, or should not just be illegal, but are immoral and uh, unholy. And um, uh, um, so, I, uh, that's one of my impressions from the ceremony. Um, the other is that. Um, the, the music was so beautiful. The the, the, the obvious feeling so heartfelt among um, uh, so many of the people there who knew him, and my heart goes out to his family and to his colleagues. And um, um, and, and I hope this ceremony gives them some some peace. Um, uh, and and may he rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, let me turn to Charlene Hunter Galt. Uh, Charlene, we've got just a couple of minutes left, but I'm interested, interested in hearing your um, closing thoughts. Thank you. I think the governor was a teachable moment uh, today with it. I mean, it was about keeping hope alive. It was about getting along with people we disagree with without being disagreeable. It was about the the true values of a democracy. And, and it also was about, no matter what our profession, I listened to Mr. Robinson, I listened to so many of the journalists, we all have a role to play to pick up the baton and carry on the true meaning of John Lewis's life. I just can't wait to pick up the baton and get to work as soon as I get off the air today. John is with me, encouraging me, you, all of us, to pick up the baton and live a good moral life as he did. Well, I know you were you were friends. Uh, your your lives mirrored each other at, at points along the way. And uh, Charlene, great to have you on and to uh, share your memories of of the late congressman. And as we noted. Um, uh, the rest of the crowd who had been there in the, in the rotunda now paying their respects uh, as the casket lies in state uh, and will eventually um, be outside the Capitol uh, for members of the public to view and to pay their respects as well. Quite a scene. And so the final journey of John Lewis has reached its midpoint from Troy, Alabama, his hometown, to Selma, then Montgomery over the weekend to Washington, D.C. today, and a grand tour of some of the places most meaningful in his life. Lewis's body will now lie in state, as I noted, through tomorrow at the Capitol. On Wednesday, he will be taken to Atlanta to lie in state in the Georgia State Capitol. On Thursday, a celebration of life at Ebenezer Baptist Church, and then John Lewis will be laid to rest, the end of an extraordinary life.
congressman, civil rights icon, tireless advocate for human rights, and always an instigator of what he liked to call good trouble. John Robert Lewis truly left this world a better place than he found it. That's a remarkable legacy. I'm Lester Holt. For all of us at NBC News, thank you for joining us. Good day. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has the very latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Savannah, it is awesome to see you and a huge thank you for rocking news now so I could just kind of hang out for a week. Oh my gosh, you got it. Are you kidding me? And I can say from experience, from having filled in for you for last week, you deserve the break. It's a lot of work. And I think you also got to celebrate your anniversary in there, right? Yeah, I did. And I got to watch you on TV, which was so much fun. I love sitting at home flipping on the, uh, the old cell phone and watching Savannah do the news. It was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And we are so happy to have you back. Now, let's start off with some.